Hello there, very good evening. Welcome to another edition of Primetime News on TV1. I'm Charlotte Benedict for the News First Team. And I'm Rochelle Tamodra. Before we take a look at your stories in detail, these are your headlines for tonight. SLFP implosion takes a new twist. Investigations into missing documents obstructed. SJB appoints Nalin Bandara to coordinate Anura Sajit debate. SLPP's Ranjit Bandara says separate candidate will run for president. Namal, not a candidate for upcoming presidential poll, says former president Mahinda. Starting off with your top story tonight, precisely two years ago, something remarkable and unexpected took place in Sri Lanka, changing the country's course. Now here's a look at April 9th, 2022, a turning point in Sri Lanka's history. Today is the 9th of April. It was precisely two years ago that a bold initiative was undertaken to showcase the formidable strength of unarmed, peaceful, non-violent people's movements, a strength surpassing any other authority. Exactly two years prior, on the 9th of April 2022, a gathering of unarmed, peaceful individuals from across the island convened at Goldface Green. Their voices raised in protest through song. This assembly arrived devoid of weaponry, carrying only placards bearing messages of dissent, devoid even of defensive measures, yet resolute in their mission to challenge the prevailing governance embodied by the rallying cry, one million to Colombo to drive away Gotha, echoing through their ranks. This collective transcended political affiliations and superficial divides. Many were strangers to one another, yet united by a shared camaraderie and a common goal to sacrifice for the betterment of their nation's future. They demanded an end to partisan politics and the immediate removal of ineffectual leaders responsible for a litany of crises, including fuel shortage, and a food crisis, a realization that these afflictions did not manifest in isolation. In an era marked by nepotism and factionalism, where rulers prioritized personal gain over the welfare of the populace, even they could not have foreseen the dawn of a new epoch, the day when ordinary citizens standing in unison would inscribe a new chapter in history. From the farthest reaches of the island, they congregated at the heart of Colombo, establishing Gota Go Gama, with a resounding call for failed leaders to relinquish their posts. Sri Lankans erstwhile divided along lines of race, religion and political allegiance, skillfully manipulated by the ruling class, found unity in purpose, transcending these divisions to champion a singular cause. What ensued was a continuous 24-hour vigil of peaceful protest with makeshift libraries springing up outside the presidential secretariat in Gaul, an intellectual hub where students, intellectuals and everyday citizens engaged in spirited discourse. Artists captured the emotions through their canvases, filmmakers disseminated knowledge and novices stood shoulder to shoulder with experts, an unprecedented convergence of minds and talents, all under the banner of non-violence. Religious leaders, including the venerable Mahasanga, lent their moral authority to the cause, bridging societal chasms perpetuated by the rulers' divisive ideologies. In solidarity, teachers, farmers, workers and students added their voices to the chorus devoid of traditional political leadership expertise supplanted by the collective wisdom of the people. This movement, fueled by unity and a shared vision, laid bare the fallacy of division, be it along racial, religious, 
or partisan lines that had plagued Sri Lankan society for seven decades post-independence. Independent observers attest that such a harmonious and universally revered ground of resistance is a rarity in history's annals. Through their sacrifices, the Sri Lankan people, custodians of a storied heritage, have imparted to the world a profound truth that the power wielded by the masses eclipses that of those ensconced in authority. The power of the people is greater than the people in power. Activists of the non-partisan people's movement, which commenced two years ago, orchestrated a series of programs across multiple locations today. Today in Colombo, the Movement for the People's Council staged a vigorous protest against the unjust taxes, rising cost of living and the IMF. They also voiced against Indian expansionism and the exploitation of national resources. The protest unfolded at the bustling Fort Railway Station. What Ranil accomplished between 2022 and 2024, even a man unfamiliar with the alphabet could grasp. Today he has seemingly sold the entirety of Sri Lanka, subjecting to Indianization. The people of our nation witness the sale of our resources. Only the people's power can uplift this country. It was announced that the IMF agreements will be legalized. Ranil Vikramasinghe can try to do whatever he wants, but the movement for People's Council will continue its struggle against attempts to do away with the people's rights. Ranil Vikramasinghe is responding with sales to the people who demand justice. He is trying to protect a certain class. The people took to the streets two years ago against it. Those demands have not been met as yet. The movement for the People's Council staged protests against the unjust taxes, rising cost of living and the IMF across the country. A protest took place opposite the Thanamal Villa bus stand. As an election draws closer, rice, scholarships and other things are given to the people. They are trying to deceive us after selling off the assets. The people should not fall prey to this. Another protest took place opposite the Kurunangala clock tower. Another protest took place in Khadruvela. The government wants us to tighten our belts. They said it two years ago. The issues of the people have not been solved. This struggle will continue until victory is achieved. The movement for the People's Council staged protests against the unjust taxes, rising cost of living and the IMF in Anuradhapura as well. Ranil Vikramasinghe, Singh, we are conspiratorial means, is holding on to power. The IMF program and Indian expansionism is taking place. If this has been happening for 77 years, the struggle is not over. A conference was held in Borella today, marking the two-year anniversary of the beginning of the Aragalia movement. The conference was organized by members of the Aragalia and civil activists. Civil organizations have come to the limelight in the country. From time to time, we see trade unions and other kind of organizations rising up and now civil organizations have become prominent. But now the question looms as to if these civil organizations are fulfilling their duties. The people were waiting for civil organizations to build up their support and throw these politicians out. But I see this movement becoming weaker. Civil organizations must now think about where they stand and be honest. They need to think why they are supporting different leaders and if we can choose a leader from among us, they need to think about this and be true to their heart. President Ranil Vikramasinghe reaffirmed the government's commitment to providing comprehensive support for the care and welfare of differently abled war heroes. He made these remarks during his participation in the distribution ceremony of electric tricycles for differently abled war heroes at the Ministry of Defence. The distribution of electric tricycles for differently abled war heroes took place at the Ministry of Defence Headquarters Complex in Sri Jayawardenepura Kote. 
The initiative implemented by the Ranavi Ruseva Authority aims to enhance the living conditions of differently abled war heroes and their families. As part of the first phase of the project, 50 electric tricycles were distributed, representing an expenditure of 17 million rupees. Following the ceremony, President Ranil Vikramasinghe have visited the differently abled war heroes, engaging in friendly conversations and expressing personal interest in their well-being. wins the debate. Sajid Premadasa's faction has designated MP Nalin Bandara to oversee the coordination of the debate between Anura and Sajid. Now on behalf of Anura Disa Naika, former MP Dr. Nalin Dejaitissa has been entrusted with a similar responsibility. But when will this debate be held? MP Nalin Bandara, who is coordinating the debate on behalf of opposition leader Sajid Premadasa, announced that May is the optimal time for the debate. However, before the leaders' debate takes place, MP Nalin Bandara proposes that a preliminary debate should occur between the economic policy-making committees of both parties. He believes that once this committee-level debate concludes, the stage will be set for the leaders to engage in their own debate. Additionally, MP Nalin Bandar emphasizes that the choice of venue and broadcasting channels for the debate can be jointly decided by both sides. Wins the debate. Opposition leader and leader of the Samagijana Balavegya, Sajid Premadasa, expressed these views about the debate in Anamadua. I am ready to debate the alternative that you propose, but remember, when you are coming for the debate, prepare to speak about the work that you have done for the people while you were not in power. Our Economic Council is ready for the debate, and I too am ready for the debate. Let's conduct both debates as well. Let's not sling mud at each other, but discuss the policies that will rebuild the country. There is no issue there. I am looking forward to presenting our vision and our plan. Wins the debate. The leader of the National People's Power Movement, Anra Kumar Disanayaka, has already said that he is ready for the debate. He appointed former parliamentarian Alin Dajatisa to coordinate the debate for the National People's Power. Wins the debate. This debate was also spoken of at the Samagijana Balavegya press briefing today. We are ready for an open debate. We have never been a party that does things behind closed doors. We have clearly stated what we are going to do to develop this country. But the National People's Power or the JVP has not yet clarified their plan and what they would do. There is no clarity regarding what they are planning on doing with the IMF either. That is the reason why we are challenging them for this debate. I saw Harini saying that Ranil Vikramasinghe should also be included in this debate. I see this as an incident similar to bringing your father to school when you get into a small fight with another student. MP Harini is trying to bring along the only person who can support them. If we are debating with Ranil Vikramasinghe, we can do that separately. Wins the debate. In the midst of political discussions, Anurag Kumar Disanayak, leader of the National People's Power, has expressed his stance on the upcoming debate. He asserts that the debate should commence with Sajid Premadasa, given the challenge posed by the Samagi Janabala Vegya. Reiterating his readiness, Disanayak emphasizes that the announcement of debate readiness should take precedence. Furthermore, he advocates for holding the debate as a priority. Should the Samagi Janabala Vegya declare the unavailability of both leaders for the debate, Disanayak suggests that the discussion could then shift to the Economic Council. When's the election? What lies ahead for the internal crisis of the Sri Lanka Freedom Party? Here's the latest. Sri Lanka Freedom Party Acting General Secretary Sarathi Dushmanta Mitrapala along with the group arrived at the party headquarters this morning. Their purpose was related to an investigation based on his complaint. The police were also present at the party headquarters during this time. However, notably absent was a representative from the faction led by Nimal Siripal de Silva. Due to this absence, access to the party office was not feasible. 
As the General Secretary, all tasks with regard to administration and operations fall under me. Therefore, I am the custodian of this building. There is no point in handing over the keys to someone else. Member of Parliament Duminda Disanayaka stated that his faction was prepared for these investigations as of yesterday. However, he expressed surprise that the investigations were scheduled for today without prior notice. We did not attend the illegal Politburo meeting yesterday. The majority of the party maintained the position of the General Secretary. We hope he will use his official power to summon the Politburo so that we can properly appoint an acting chairman. Meanwhile, former President Maitri Pala Sirisena, the former chairman of the Sri Lanka Freedom Party, has embarked on a three-day trip to Thailand. Accompanying him on this visit are several family members. Today, press conferences were organized in various locations to express support for former President Maitri Pala Sirisena. During the press conference held in Kandy, a group that included party organizers unanimously passed a resolution endorsing Maitri Pala Sirisena. <laughs> In the Sri Lanka Freedom Party political committee, comprising 15 esteemed members, our former Chief Minister, Governor Sarateka Nayaka, representing the central province of the Freedom Party, holds a pivotal position within the Politburo. As a fellow member of the Politburo, I too play a role in shaping our party's direction. However, neither Governor Eka Nayaka nor I received any formal communication from the Politburo regarding recent developments. Yesterday's television coverage depicted only a handful, three, four or at most five members at the Politburo, leaving many of us in the dark about the unfolding situation. This perplexing turn of events coincides with the refusal of government ministers aligned with our party to acquiesce to demands for their resignation, ostensibly leading to internal strife. Moreover, attempts to oust our party's leader have persisted, exemplified by recent legal actions initiated by Chandrika Kumaratunga. These concerted efforts hint at a larger scheme orchestrated by elements within the government. It appears evident that these moves are geared towards shifting the Sri Lanka Freedom Party to the UNP or the SLPP. <laughs> Everyone must adhere strictly to the provisions outlined in the party's constitution. Arbitrary actions are not permissible. As mentioned in paragraph 16, the convening of the Politburo must occur under the auspices of the chairman, who assumes the responsibility of summoning members. In the event that the secretary is to convene the meeting, such actions necessitates the explicit endorsement of the chairman. There has been no recent instance where the party chairman has convened a political committee meeting. These are the views expressed by Vice Chairman of the party, Ranjit Siambalapitiya. These are matters that need to be discussed properly. SLFP is an important party in the country, a party that made great changes in the country. Such a party cannot provide deep answers to main matters concerning the party in a rush. The country is in chaos. They make use of the stage at every instance possible, be it at the right situation or at the wrong situation. Therefore, it is not you, but us, who have to provide answers to these questions. The IMF has called for closer oversight of the rapidly expanding two trillion US dollar private credit market. The news first finance report brings you more details. The news first finance report. Fast growing two trillion dollar private credit market warrants closer watch. The International Monetary Fund has issued a call for heightened scrutiny over the fast-growing private credit market, which has surged to a staggering $2 trillion. In an article published on the 8th of April 2024, the IMF emphasized the necessity of monitoring this sector closely due to its rapid expansion and potential risks. The IMF highlighted concerns regarding the lack of transparency and regulation within the private credit market, which encompasses lending activities outside the traditional banking system. According to the IMF, the increasing popularity of private credit poses significant challenges, including potential vulnerabilities to financial stability and macroeconomic disruptions. 
IMF underscores the importance of implementing robust regulatory frameworks and enhancing transparency to mitigate the associated risks effectively. Additionally, the IMF stressed the need for policymakers to remain vigilant and proactive in addressing potential threats posed by the private credit market to safeguard global financial stability. Fed rate cut expectations for 2024 fall to lowest since October. Future traders have reduced bets on how much the Federal Reserve will cut rates this year to the lowest level since October amid evidence of continued strength in the U.S. economy. Fed funds futures contracts for December on Monday reflected expectations of around 60 basis points in rate cuts this year compared to some 150 basis points that had been priced at the start of 2024. The prospect of a first 25 basis points cut in June stood at 49%, down from 57% a week ago. The News First Finance Report India is gearing up to supply thousands of metric tons of onions to Sri Lanka and UAE days after it approved limited exports of essential commodity to the Maldives. New Delhi is planning to supply thousands of metric tons of onions to Sri Lanka and the United Arab Emirates. According to the Hindustan Times, India has supplied 10,000 metric tons of onions over and above the agreed 14,400 ton cap. The world's largest global exporter of onions, India has either banned or limited export permits for the in-demand vegetable as well as for rice, wheat flour, pulses and sugar since last December. Subsequently, onion prices are believed to have risen dramatically in neighboring countries that have depended on onion imports from India to meet their domestic demand. Through a special quota arrangement, the Indian government recently allowed exports to Bangladesh, Sri Lanka, Mauritius, Bahrain and Bhutan. Lanka Satos announced the reduction of prices for eight essential commodities. The prices of dried chili, imported Chinese onions, imported Indian onions, imported Pakistan onions, garlic, potatoes, dal and white kakulu rice have been reduced. The Indian Coast Guard rushed to support a Sri Lankan fishing trawler that was in distress in the northern waters. The rescue trawler is now being towed back to Sri Lanka. A local fishing trawler in distress was rescued by the Indian Coast Guard with the coordination of the Maritime Rescue Coordination Centre in Colombo. The rescue trawler is now being towed back to Sri Lanka by another local fishing trawler. The troubled fishing trawler experienced an engine malfunction while navigating in the northern waters, approximately 91 kilometres away from Point Pedro, and was adrift, edging closer towards Indian territory. The local fishing trawler, Kalpani, was reported to have left the Cod Bay Fisheries Harbour, Trincomalee, with six fishermen on the 22nd of March 2024 for a fishing voyage. Today, a follow-up on the initiatives undertaken by Gammander in Mahavilachya Anuradhapura was carried out. This review aimed to assess the progress of the ongoing projects. Now, during this visit, Gammander engaged with the villagers seeking insights into the benefits that they have derived from these community-driven efforts. The gum and the team undertook several impactful projects in Mahavilachya. Notably, Club HNB also played a vital role in these endeavours. Clean water provision for Yaya Haya, computer laboratory renovation at Salia Mala College, as well as improving sanitary facilities at the school premises are a few such endeavours. Today, Gamadha was accompanied by a delegation from Club HNB to explore the positive impact these efforts have had on the villagers. They visited the area to witness firsthand the transformation brought about by these projects. The chief incumbent of the historic Sri Saliya Rajamaha Viharya, Venerable Kahatagas Digiliye Chanda Anandathero, invoked blessings on the gathering. Jonathan Alas, the managing director and CEO of HNB, HNB head of club Michel De Silva, among other senior officials from Hatton National Bank, were present for the event. Ravi Gamage, the general manager of Group Human Resources, represented the capital Maharaja Group. In addition, General Secretary of Gamadha Prasannath Korala and V-Force National Organizer Gihan Udyoga 
were among others present. Adahasak Hundaina Adahasak Niberdina if an idea is good and if that idea is the correct one, there is no need to go around telling people about it. Even if you whisper it to another as a secret, it will spread like wildfire. When we launched Gamadha, we did it in the midst of the greatest of difficulties. We started with a few. We witnessed the shortcomings in the country. There are some things that a government cannot attend to as well. Given the volume of the work they have, we decided that we will do whatever we can for our brothers and sisters. As the days went by, the message spread far and wide. The managing director and CEO of Petrin B addressed the gathering. Developed economies such as India, China, Singapore reach such status solely due to the commitment and determination of people like you here today. As one of the leading banks in the country, we come across the most hospitable and innocent people from various walks of life. Among the projects that we completed at the Yaya 6 village are the water purification project, renovation of the roadway and infrastructure development at the Saliamala school. This would have uplifted the living standards of the villagers here and in surrounding villages as well. This is something that makes us all happy. <laughs> A brainstorming session took place at the Mahavilachya historic Sri Salya Rajma Viharya. Venerable Kutikulame Pema Lankara Thero, lecturer Sagara Satyapala, and retired principal of Royal College Kalambo Sudat Lianagunavardhana spearheaded the program. Today, a special event was held to honor the inaugural principal of Udhavilkar's College in Jaffna as the school celebrates its remarkable 200th anniversary. A momentous commemorative event unfolded at Udhavilkar's College celebrating the birthday of the college's esteemed first principal, Harriet Winslow. Under the guidance of the current principal, the event unfolded within the grandeur of the college's main hall. Udhavil Girls College, founded in 1824 in Udhavil, owes to uh, its legacy to late Harriet Winslow, who served as its principal from 1824 to 1833. The occasion was marked by special events and a prayer service. The college community witnessed captivating art performances by talented students. Distinguished attendees included Archbishop Reverend Dr. V. Patmanathan of the Church of South India. This memorable gathering celebrated the rich heritage of Udhavil Girls College. In more local news, the cabinet has granted approval for local students to pursue medical degrees at the General Sir John Kothalavala Defence University. The cabinet of ministers approved the proposal presented by the president to recruit undergraduate candidates to the Faculty of Medicine of General Sir John Kothalavala Defence University to study medicine and art on the basis of payment based on those criteria. News first with the people. Muslims in Sri Lanka will celebrate Eid Ul Fitr, also known as Ramazan, tomorrow. The Colombo Grand Mosque made the official announcement after the crescent for the month of Shalwal was sighted. Up next is the world today with details of historic heat and a much awaited trial surrounding offshore corruption. Didmini, uh, Europe's climate monitor has said that March was the hottest on record and the 10th straight month of historic heat with sea surface temperatures also hitting a shocking new high. 
Now it is the latest red flag in a year already marked by climate extremes and rising greenhouse gas emissions, spurring fresh calls for more rapid action to limit global warming. Now Hashni, every month since June 2023 has beaten its own hottest ever tag and March 2024 was no exception. The March record was only broken by 0.1 degrees Celsius, but it is the broader trend that was more alarming. Now, shifting your focus to related news, a group of older Swiss women have won the first ever climate case victory in the European Court of Human Rights. The women, mostly in their 70s, said that their age and gender made them particularly vulnerable to the effects of heat waves linked to climate change. Uh, did mean the court said that Switzerland's effort to meet its emission reduction targets had been a woefully inadequate. Now, it is the first time the powerful court has ruled on global warming. And Swedish campaigner Greta Thunberg joined activists celebrating at the court today. And this is only the beginning of climate litigation. All over the world, more and more people are taking their government to court, holding their, them responsible for their actions. Uh, did you mean Millions of people across Mexico and US and Canada looked to the skies on Monday uh, to witness a total solar eclipse carve a narrow path of darkness across the continent. Now its shadow first touched the surface of the earth in the Pacific Ocean before traveling across Mexico, turning daylight into darkness as crowds watched on. The eclipse rolled over the border into the US and brought darkness to large areas of Texas, including the cities of Austin and Dallas. Total solar eclipses happen about every 18 months, but they're often in unpopulated or remote areas, whereas this one passed over several big cities across three countries. While neither Washington DC nor New York City were in the path of totality, both saw about 90% of the sun covered by the moon and plenty of people took to the streets and skyscrapers to catch a view. Uh, Didmini, shifting to news from New Zealand. Uh, New Zealand announced it has tightened its visa rules, introducing language and skill criteria and shortening work permit lengths uh, in response to unsustainable net migration. Now, the changes to the accredited employer worker visa scheme have gone into immediate effect. It will mean that New Zealand is better testing the local labor market and reducing the risks of putting New Zealanders out of work. Shifting your focus to another controversy that unraveled a couple of years ago, the trial of 27 people charged in connection with the Panama Papers money laundering scandal has started at a criminal court in Panama. The leak of secret financial documents in 2016 revealed how some of the world's wealthiest people stashed their assets in offshore companies. The defendants include Jürgen Mozak and Ramon Fonseca Mora, who founded the now defunct law firm Mozak Fonseca. Thailand is prepared to accept 100,000 people fleeing Myanmar as fighting near a crucial border town rumbled on. Now, Thailand shares the 2,400 kilometer border with Myanmar, which has been embroiled in a civil war since the junta overthrew the democratically elected government in 2021. Over the weekend, there were local reports of intense clashes near Mewedi town across the border from the Thai town of Mysore. Now, shifting your focus again to the Israel-Gaza war, Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu says a date has been set to invade Rafah in southern Gaza as true talks with Hamas in Cairo are ongoing but do not appear close to the finish line. In a video statement in Hebrew, Netanyahu reiterated his position that a ground military operation in Rafah bordering Egypt, where more than 1.5 million Palestinians are sheltering, is essential for victory in the war. Uh, now, the knee as an update, this comes as Hamas war presented with a new proposal in ceasefire talks at the end of the weekend, but one that does not appear to be able to secure a deal. Uh, Gaza Health Ministry said 153 were killed, 60 were injured in Gaza in last 24 hours. The casualties bring the total number of people killed in Gaza since the 7th of October to 33,360, with 75,993 injured. At least 8,000 additional people are missing. And that's a wrap of uh, the world today. Uh, for the News News team, I'm Hashni Pathirana. And I'm Bitmini De Silva.
Thank you very much, uh, Ditmini and Hashini. Before we take a look at your sports news uh, tonight, uh, let's delve into uh, what's happening in Sri Lanka's political arena because there's so much happening right now. Uh, one of the main political parties in Sri Lanka is the Sri Lanka Podu Jana Peramuna. What is happening inside the Sri Lanka Podu Jana Peramuna as far as the election is concerned? Will they name a presidential candidate or will they support President Ranil Vikramasinghe, who they themselves supported in Parliament and brought into power. Mahindra Rajapaksa, leader of the Sri Lanka Podujana Peramuna, said today that this decision will be taken in the near future. A book written about Mahinda Rajapaksa titled Janahada Vila PP Siapata Mahinda was launched today. The book was penned by Venerable Vavahamandue Subodha Damathero and Venerable Vavahamandue Lochana Damathero. The event was attended by several ministers. The Sri Lanka Pudujana Peruna Political Committee convened this afternoon at the official residence of Mahindu Rajapaksa in Vijayavama, Colombo. <laughs> After extensive deliberation with our political committee and party leadership, including Mahindra Rajapaksa, our focus converges on ensuring the forthcoming May Day celebration emerges as an unparalleled success. As the Sri Lanka Pudujana Peramuna, we are mobilizing our party members from every corner of our nation to converge upon Campbell Park. Furthermore, today, amidst the deliberations of our Politburo, a pivotal decision was made regarding our forthcoming presidential candidate. We shall meticulously evaluate the presented candidates within our party ranks, and it is Mahindra Rajapaksa who will make such an announcement. <laughs> game always. Uh, I played 10 years in international cricket. I know my skills. On this edition is a news first sports roundup. Sri Lankan women's cricket captain Shamari Patapattu has cleared the air on her future in international cricket and said she will decide after the T20 World Cup qualifiers next month. Sri Lanka women's cricket captain Chamari Atapakto sparked speculation in the cricketing community by implying retirement in a now deleted Facebook post in which she said, Final duty for my nation following Sri Lanka's stunning T20 series triumph over South Africa. Prior to the ODI series against South Africa, the 34 year old stressed that her major focus is on impending commitments for Sri Lanka. Atapakto will lead Sri Lanka at least until the qualifiers where they must reach the finals to secure spot in the main competition which will be held later this year in Bangladesh. Sri Lanka is in Group A of the qualifiers which begins on April 25th in the UAE together with Scotland, Thailand, Uganda and the United States. The top two teams from each group will advance to the semi-finals. And that's a wrap on this edition's News First Sports Roundup. I'll see you soon with another edition. And that's a wrap of primetime news on TV1 for tonight. Thank you for watching. Good night.